But what we're going to talk about is a different kind of changing environment. And we're looking at, at, at what's you know, a trend that's going on out there and, and, and it's towards sustainability. Now, you know, where is a lot of this fueled? A lot of it's done through social media. I think there's probably a big opportunity there uh, for us. You know, we talked about how do we reach the non-farming audience. Uh, I think there's probably opportunities for us there. Uh, but social media, is, I think just a few people influence the buying habits and, and the thoughts of a lot of people. So what are they talking about on social media? You know, uh, talking about GMOs, you know, they want uh, GMO label products. Sometimes I wish it was easy, that easy. Sometimes I wish that organic cotton was labeled enough to say, you know, that you can look at it and say, okay, well, I know that's organic cotton. Because if you look at the amount of organic cotton products in the store versus how much organic cotton is really grown, things don't quite line up. And so those are some of the things that are going on with what we eat, what we wear, so forth. But you know, I'm, I'm going to give you two for the price of one today. You know, I'm going to tell you a story, and they're both true stories. But a lot of people just don't know where their food comes from. I'm going to let y'all read that. But my brother-in-law down the road from me, he lives all about two or three miles down the road. Uh, his boy uh, had a hog, got a bread, raised a litter of hogs, and was, he was selling uh, uh, butcher hogs. Well, a lady come out to his farm, and she said, well, like, you know, I really want to get more in touch with my food. I want to know where my food comes from and all this. And so she come out and looked at the hog and said, oh, this is exactly what I want. Well, in Basel, I live in Northeast Arkansas. Well, in Basel, there's a processing place. And he said, well, okay, I'll save the hog. I'll take it to Mitchell's, and you give them your cut order, and you can go there and pick it up and sell with him. And she said, cut order? What are you talking about? He said, well, you know, you need to tell them know if you want whole hams or you want slice, how you want everything cured, if you want pork loins pulled out, if you want pork chops and how big. She said, well, that's no problem. I just want it all made into bacon. <laughs> There's a ton of people think the food comes from the back of the grocery store. So they want sustainability. The definition that, that I like to use or think about is, you know, is a production system that meets the needs, our current needs, and still improves the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We talk about what our customers are on on our cotton. We've got a lot of there's different initiatives out there to go through and, and certify uh, that this is grown in a responsible manner, it's sustainable and all that. Uh, but it's not just cotton. If you look in here, there's the most updated version I have. Uh, Wally World, Walmart's on there, bear crop signs, corn, soybean, rice, potatoes. But you know there's NGOs on there too, World Wildlife, World Wildlife Federation. It's made up of, of of NGOs and of, of ag companies or ag groups that really want to promote how sustainable our ag production is. And we need some way to measure that. Uh, but that's really the basis of this whole group. We're results oriented. We don't care whether you do it organic. We don't care whether you do it conventional. We don't care whether you use animals or whatever. Uh, we want to look at how we get to the end of the road. And so if we look at cotton, but if you look at how we compare today, and this was published in 2012, so we looked at 2011, and compare that to what we were doing in 1980. For land use, we need 30%, we use 30% less land today to produce a pound of cotton than we did in 1980. And so the same logic, you know, with soil loss, we look at erosion, we lose 68% less soil today than we did 30 years ago to grow one pound of cotton or one bale of cotton, whatever we're looking at. Irrigation water use, and when we talk about irrigation water use, this, this is how many pounds of cotton we produce per inch of water over the dry land year. When we look at that, we use 75% less water to grow a pound of cotton now than we did 30 years ago. And you see the, green, the energy uh, greenhouse gas. We're making tremendous improvements. But when we look at this, the Walmarts and the Gaps and, and all the Marks and Spencers, they say, well, that's fine. You know, but we want to know what you're going to do down the road.
In our system, when we say it's grown organic, we have a lot of rules, don't we? And so if you look at labor requirements, safety, <coughs> food safety, workplace safety, child labor, <coughs> pest site regulation, water stewardship, conservation programs, those are all things that are spelled out in a lot of the cotton initiatives that are out here to be able to label this as like PCI cotton. Well, our regulatory environment meets all those criteria. So we come up with the cotton leaves because, because simply because our, our, our production is so transparent. You know, if you look at water, again, you know, we're using 75% less. I think some of it's interesting that 50% of the cotton in the world receives some form of irrigation. Here in the U.S., uh, we're only looking at 30%, 36% of the crop, of the whole U.S. crop receiving some form of irrigation. Uh, pest management, that gets a lot of attention, especially in insecticide sprays. Uh, but you look over the last 25 years, there's been a 50% reduction in the number of insecticide applications. Uh, energy use uh, improvements that we talked about a while ago, greenhouse gases. And, and I think it's really interesting that cotton has a neutral greenhouse footprint because uh, there, you know, there's more cotton stored in the cotton fiber and in the soil as a result of the plant growing uh, than is emitted during production. So actually, you know, we're positive on greenhouse gas production. And uh, an initiative like this, and we're talking about traceability, the mills want to be able to trace your cotton, that cotton back to an individual field. So with our PBI permanent bill identification system, we have that. Uh, also with cotton leads, we're going through and, and you know, with the life cycle index. Uh, we know what it takes to grow cotton in the field. We do LCI numbers on the textiles. And so we know what energy is used, how much water is used. And we take those, those numbers and go into LCA, which basically, uh, like the, the, the nutrition code on a box of cornflakes, tells you how, many, uh, how much fat, how much sugar, yada yada is in the box. Well, a lot of companies are wanting to have that for the particular garments, so with the LCA, and so they go through everything from, from you know, what, how much energy is used to grow your seed, and then, plant your seed, go all the way through how much energy is in your fertilizer, embedded energy uh, into pesticides and fertilizer, your application costs, through the manufacturer, how much water is used, and it even goes through the consumer end. You know, how many times do you typically wash it? You know, how long do you have it? You know, are you the final user or does it go on to somebody else so, so they do cradle to grave? And so those are some of the information that, that some of the, our customers are wanting. Uh, it's, it's really kind of mind-boggling what's going on. The part that we have in there is a field print calculator. That's kind of what I'm talking about, you know, with this field print calculator to go in, you, you enter what you've done in the field, and it, and it tells you uh, how much energy, uh, how much greenhouse gas. But when you go into the field print calculator, basically you put in your location, you do, it's that pivot, you draw a circle, you know, kind of draw a polygon around that circle. But anyway, when you do that, it ties into NRCS data. So it populates it with a slow, a slow length, the soil texture, and a lot of other things that'll go into Russell too to help calculate uh, your your erosion. At the end, you'll get a field print. Compare, you know, what you do, which is the blue shaded, to the national average and the state average. Well, the national average is basically set at 50% of the distance from the from the inside circle to the or from the inside of the figure to the outside. So that uh, symmetrical shape there is the national average. In the, the shaded part, and there's where you are. The smaller that shaded area on the blue is, the better you're doing compared to the national average. And then we have a, a, the stated average in there as well as what the other, the other line. When we started working on the field print calculator, we wanted to make sure, well, did it work? Are we comfortable with it? And that's where the TAWC come in. Uh, the, the growers that share their information with uh, Texas Alliance Water Conservation, uh, I think that's just a wonderful thing. Uh, we visit with the growers and they say, well, it was okay for us to, 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 for them to share that data with us, to put this in the calculator to see if it even worked. And that's how we're working with Rick and we're working with others to try to make sure that what we're seeing on paper kind of matches up with what goes on in the field. We have a whole host of things uh, from no-till to conventional till, different irrigations. Uh, uh, we've got a good number of acres in there, so I think this really gave it a good test. So what I did in this first column, and but anyway, the, the lint yield equivalent is basically the higher the yield, uh, the, the lower the number. So that's uh, 20, there's 21 fields up there. So number one had the highest yield. Number 21 had the lowest yield. 
conservation efficiency. But I looked at, okay, how many pounds of cotton did we produce per ton of soil that we lost? Try to look at efficiency. You know, we talked on the, the panel talked about efficiency. So number one up there produced the most pounds of cotton per ton of soil that they lost. Uh, soil carbon is just kind of with the soil conditioning index. Uh, you know, it ranks those from, you know, we're looking at this, are we improving soil carbon or are we decreasing soil carbon over time? Number one had the most increase in soil carbon. Uh, 21 had, the, had the, the least decrease in soil carbon. Irrigation water use again, number one up there, produced the most pounds of cotton per inch of water that they lost. Energy use, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, same way. Uh, number one was the most efficient. And so then what I did, I just went through and did a straight average across all those. I didn't weigh them or anything. And, and that's how this, and that's how this table's uh, sorted. Uh, just overall resource efficiency. And I think the real nice thing that we have with this program, uh, we know what the producers did, and then they, they put budgets uh, information to those. And then we was able to go through and say, okay, well, here's their total variable cost. How many pounds of cotton did they produce per dollar total variable cost? And number one, produced the most pounds of cotton, and I, I like to think of total variable cost is out of pocket. So I like to think, how many pounds of cotton did you produce per dollar out of pocket? So number one, produced the most pounds, number 21, produced the least pounds. And so we have the capability of going through and doing something like this. And then when we look at these, it match up pretty good. And some of the economists I visit with, you know, this is just a one-year data, and that's a problem with some of this, Ken, it's just one-year data. You know, when we look at varieties, you know, we, you know, one year is better than nothing, but we like to have multiple years. But, but it is good to think that, that over time, they feel like the correlation between how efficient we are with the dollars we spend are going to match up real good. So what I did, I went through, and, and from 2007 through 2011 is the data we have in the calculator. We have five years. Okay, for all those producers that had three or more years of cotton in there, okay, how often were they in the top 25%? So if you look at N right there, that's how many times, in three, four, or five, that they had cotton during the five years. And the sales that are highlighted are the ones that were in the top 25% half the time or more. And so you kind of see some of these people are pretty consistently in the top quarter compared to their neighbors. We also looked at, at the top 50%. And so we can go in and see, you know, some of these people are pretty consistently in the top half, and then some, some are not. But anyway, this kind of gives you an indication on how you do with your neighbor. So this is something you can do. What are other things we can do? When you look at energy use on this, I'll let you know on, on irrigated cotton, about half of your energy is going to be for irrigation. About another quarter of all your energy is going to be from the embedded energy, the energy it took to make the fertilizer. You know, you have a little bit of expense to put it out, but the big part of the energy for fertilizer is going to become from, you know, uh, pulling nitrogen from the, the oxygen. You know, when we talk about cover crops up here on the panel earlier, we talk about the impact it has on soil health, increasing your organic matter. And with that residue on there, you do a better job, you know, you have maintained soil structure uh, uh, to some degree. You know, you do a better job of getting, of harvesting the rainfall, getting it in your profile. So then if you take and put all those factors in together when we look at uh, variable rate, we look at no-till, uh, we look at cover crops, uh, apply those, uh, those practices when you see the our field print much smaller. The, the bear program is just taking this, you know, we've got these things, we document what we're doing, and then we have a brand new product, so I think that's, you know, maybe worth more in the, in, in the, the, the stream. So anyway, if you have questions about the field print calculator, it's, it's, it's on the internet. Anybody can get on and use that. You know, we talked about what our customers want, and they want to know that, and that and when they source their fibers, they want to know that the fiber they're buying is grown responsibly or is sustainable, uh, whatever word they want to use. And that's what we're trying to provide. But kind of who's in the driver's seat on this? You know, the consultants, are, I mean, well, the producers are really the one in the driver's seat, but I like to think of, of you as consultants as being the GPS up on the dash. I think y'all as a group play a very important role in going this way. And to be able to, and, you know, when we look at information like this, if you have a group of farmers that want to know how they compare to one another or how they look, we can go in and look at this. But anyway, that's, that's really what I had on the program to discuss, and I'll be happy to.
to take any questions if, if, if you'd like. Yeah, you know, the question was, are the big companies taking notice of this? And really, when, when you look at, you know, remember the diagram that, that shows who the members of the field of market was, the Walmarts and the Kellogg's and General Mills, they wanted this yesterday. They're really pushing the commodity groups for us to feel comfortable with this, to take this out to the next step. So we're pushing, it's, it's a real priority for the National Hot Council and Hot Incorporated to start getting people introduced to this, see the merits of this, and for them to want to go in and hear more of their feelings into this. So